Good evening and welcome back to the shop. Tonight we're going to look into the wonderful world of exotic woods. I've got a few woods here I've used over the years and typically I'm using exotic woods as an accent wood, as most people do. Um, they tend to be harder, much harder, heavier. Quite a few of them have uh, unusually high oil content, which makes it hard to glue them up, certain species. Um, some of them are nasty, hard, and difficult on your cutting tools and will dull your knives on your joiner. You can't even joint the thing and it'd be near impossible to hand plane. So there are challenges with exotic woods, but the payoff is great. As an accent, they're wonderful. And I've often used ebony, real gaboon ebony in my work, and I'm looking more and more for substitutes because it's getting expensive and it's on the cities, cities I want to say cities list, maybe that's how you say it, it's C-I-T-E-S. Um, and that stands for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So they are trying to control, that's of wild fauna and flora. Oh. <laughs> wild. So, so that it doesn't get taken and ruined by mm -hmm. international sales as things can happen in these various countries. So they'll put a limitation on things and some have that on them. So uh, I have gotten to know a lot of these woods over the years just as accents, like I say, and I've often looked into this book. This has some good research or profiles on various woods. I don't know if this book is still available, but I've always loved looking at it. It has just a one page per species and it shows you what the, the leaves are like. It tells you in general how large the trees are, the kind of wood you can expect, any uh, unusual characteristics. And then it tells you the specific gravity, which is basically describing the density, the weight per board foot. And then you get a magnification of the end grain, which is essentially the fingerprint of that unique species of wood. So you could use these with a little eyeglass to um, check it out. All right, so basswood, you know, we've got bubinga, butternut. So you have all these cool species right next to each other in this book. Nice. If you go check it out and see if it's still available, I got this handed to me by John Lorette himself 25 years ago. I was at the League of New Hampshire Crafts Fair and he said, want to check this book out but wow, anyway great guy so as i just mentioned here's some gaboon ebony this is that classic jet black piano keys i often use the ebony as some of you know and cut it up into lines and lay it as an accent to uh, various pieces we did have a video we did on shop night live of making your own inlay lines from a billet like a Look, a chunk like this and we're linking to that video at the end if you want to make your own lines I don't want to get into that tonight um, this is a, a substitute for ebony they're calling this now the Mexican ebony it's Catalox I wanted to say that correctly Catalox it's it's heavy it's it's tough on the blades too, but it feels a lot like ebony, like if I felt this. But you can see next to it, it's not exactly jet black. It's, it's got a little bit of purplish hue to it, but it probably would color up and look really nice um, and dark. I don't know what the uh, specific gravity of that is, but Gaboon Ebony is um, right between, right around 0.9 which means uh, it's just the ratio of the relative density of this wood to water. So it's this relative density over water. So if water is 1.0, you have to think if you have a higher than one uh, specific gravity for your materials, that means it will sink. 
Okay, if it's lower than one, it will float, but barely. Oh, I meant to have a tub of water out here. <laughs> Try that. Because this feels like it should sink, huh. right? I mean, it feels heavy. But some of these other species, like Cocobolo, uh, this is in the rosewood family. Um, here's a hunk of Cocobolo. And look at that. I mean, this is hacked from a tree. Uh, somebody gave me this a while back, but it's a beast to cut it open. Um, I just jointed that a little bit and it got really black. But over here you have those characteristic classic orange tones with the dark lines in it, indicative of Cocobolo. It's a kind of rosewood. But here is another kind of rosewood. And this is the, I think, the, the best of the rosewoods, Brazilian rosewood. When you plane it or sand it, let me just sand a little bit here. You know. Now it has a reddish tone to it. You see that kind of reddish tone? But it's the fragrance. You get this sweet, um, like flowery fragrance from this mm -hmm. wood, which is where it gets its name. Nice. So classic, beautiful hardwood. Uh, Cocobolo, I meant to say, this is 1.1 on the specific gravity. So Cocobolo would not float in water. It would dead sink. And man, when you feel this, it is literally like a large boulder. Um, and then you have bloodwood. Oh, I don't have bloodwood here. But bloodwood is just under one. It's 0.96. I wrote Bloodwood because I had an interesting experience a few years ago where a couple were over at Goose Bay of all places and they had this little uh, mudroom in their house and they just wanted a lid for their little seat in the mudroom where you come in for this box. And it was probably, I don't know, it was six, eight feet long, I forget. Well, they wanted a special wood and they shopped around and they bought Bloodwood. And they called and asked me, could you just glue this up for us so we could have a nice lid for the top of our seat? And I'm like, uh, sure, I'll give it a shot. I said, but I don't really know <laughs> what's going to happen here. Uh, but anyway, they spent a lot of money on this. And I was thinking, man, you could have just got nice mahogany or something <laughs> as I was gr grousing throughout the project because that bloodwood was murderous on all the knives in the shop. So it was, they brought over a quarter and I had to dress this down. Not only was it horrible on the knives, like I could make a few passes and the knives were just bone dull. And so loud were they crashing into this wood. It was like you were trying to play in stone. And then after I got them thickness a little bit, they, they went all wanky in shape. They started twisting. It was the largest, nightmare project I've ever had. And it was just a simple long pan of glue up. So I, I do not like blood wood, but another red wood that's really more pleasant to work with is um, purple heart. And I've got some right here and it's pretty obvious why they call it purple heart. This is, uh, has that color and over time it will lose some of that color but it's pretty nice material. Um, this is a smaller piece that I just planed and it looks a bit darker right after it's been planed. So does the Cocobolo. This is a piece of Cocobolo, which I planed and it looks almost black, but it does get those warmer brown tones back after it oxidizes a little bit. All right, so another one is lacewood. I only have this tiny piece. A lot of these exotics you'll find are sold to the uh, smaller project makers, as a lot of you may have experienced making pens or small um, items like that where letter openers, you know, all the gadgets. I don't know if we've all gone down that road, but I have <laughs> for Christmas gifts, uh, perfumers, keychains. I mean, you name it. There's, there's a wood for you. Yes. And... Uh, so I try to usually squirrel away nice hardwoods when it comes time for that. 
Here's a piece of bocote. This, I love the look of this wood. It's also a relative or sometimes, I think it's sometimes referred to as Lauro Preto. Am I saying that right? Uh, but Bocote has this lighter brown stripiness. So it's distinguished from Cocobolo in that it's lighter. And you can tell that the, uh, the specific gravity is different. It's 0.6 to 0.8, where the Cocobolo is 1.1. So you can just feel the weight. When you pick up the Cocobolo, it's quite different. Um, wait, it's just a chunk. So anyway, that's just a very small sampling of the woods, but wonderful to explore and have a few on hand here and there. And this is just a few. I don't have a ton of exotics around, but they're hard to cut into. I mean, what are you going to do with this? Who's got an idea for me <laughs> on this chunk? Uh, it's got some cracks. There's even some rocks embedded to here. I mean, that could be a nightmare. Oh, I wasn't even mentioning during that little discussion of some of these exotics, the hardness scale. I actually wrote down the Janka hardness. That's another thing to consider when you start working with these things, like the Gaboon Ebony. Well, let's just, for reference, hard maple is about 1400 on the hardness scale. This is the pressure it takes to press a 0.444 inch diameter ball Half its, half its distance into the wood. I mean, the pressure. So 3,080 pounds for Gaboon Ebony. More than twice hard maple. And that's the hardest one I have here. Cocobolo is just barely under that at 2,960 pounds. And Bloodwood, of course, Bloodwood. That's up there. That's at 2,900. So can you imagine running that over your planer? No wonder I was killing myself on that. Yeah, the suggestion is mallets. Make some mallets. mallets. Excellent. Nice and hard. Yeah, hidden. you could make a real exotic classic mallet yep. with this stuff. That would make a good head and you wouldn't need to have a large one um, to get the weight you want. Um, yeah, it just feels wasteful to take a big chunk. So, um, so what I wanted to do was just think of a fun little project we could make that would get the most out of a piece of exotic wood outside of the ones that you have to buy a kit for. So instead of pens, letter openers, those kind of things that you get the usually the brass piece and you make the decorative handle for a knife or whatever, I wanted a, a project that was just pure exotic hardwood. And I got poking around uh, the other night and I found that chopsticks are a thing. I mean, they're a thing, a major thing in a large part of the world. Yes. <laughs> which we don't get into. And every time I pick them up, I feel clumsy. I go for it for a little while and then I just quietly set them down and pick up the fork. But if you have someone who's an aficionado, or loves that Asian culture, and you know they would appreciate a <laughs> gift like this, it doesn't, this be good. it doesn't knock you out to make these. And would you believe it? We're gonna make a jig. Now you're gonna appreciate Ooh, this cool. if you wanna make jig, if you wanna make chopsticks, because I realized there's a chopstick jig you can buy from Bridge City Tools. Some of you may already know this. <laughs> it's a nice metal, <laughs> contraption with a built-in small plane that works with it. And it basically guides the plane on a nice smooth taper and you just skim all four sides after getting it, um, after starting with a small little block the appropriate length. So I looked at that and I thought, I can make one of those. <laughs> and, and sure enough, I could. It's not exactly as fast, but I'm gonna save you right now $250 because <laughs> You probably have everything you need already. You probably have a block plane. That's pretty much it. And you need a few pieces of wood that you're gonna make this jig from. I decided to go with the one that is the most friendly to this jig and has a nice straight taper. And that's the classic Japanese chopsticks. We had a, an exchange student through high school 
wonderful, Jess was her American name she got. We couldn't believe how much fun and joy she brought to our house. And occasionally she would use chopsticks. And I remember she had some, didn't she leave some back she here? She did. Yeah. But I've discovered that in South Korea, they tend to use metal, uh, but these were not metal, I don't think. They were heavier. She had some both, both different kinds. Yeah. So I want to make the classic Japanese in uh, an exotic wood. And it's good to use the exotic because they have that higher specific gravity. They have a little more weight to them. They feel more substantial. If you made one of these out of even like mahogany, um, I played around with one with mahogany and it just felt so feathery light. I mean, cheap. Um, but we want a little more substance to this so people would keep it. I made a, like a little jig. What we needed to create are these ramps that taper down the same angle we want our chopstick to be. So that'll taper and give us that shape. So we need to shape these little long wedges of wood. Those are gonna be the ramps that our hand plane is going to ride on and be almost like a custom shooting board for tapering wood, okay? So we need to make these ramps. We need a kind of tapering jig to make those. So I've just got a piece of MDF. This is about 15 inches long. Oh, actually 17 and a half. The length of the chopsticks, by the way, is about between nine to 10 inches long is the typical length of a chopstick. They say to measure the distance between your index finger and your thumb and multiply by 1.5. So you got hands, it tends, the male hands are a little larger, so they tend to have a little larger chopstick. But this jig will work. You can cut it to whatever length after, but I'm gonna make this jig for a 10, and then you can always cut them shorter. So if I measure approximate distance here on my uh, workpiece, let's just say, let's say I'm gonna have my my um, chopstick be somewhere out of the middle of this, okay? Doesn't really matter here. So I'm gonna just go to the 10 and then the zero starting point, all right? Now, with the Japanese chopsticks, they're quite slender at the end. So I'm gonna let this overhang just, this'll be like the end of my chopstick. When, when I looked it up, it was 0.08 they tend to be, which is just a 64th more than a 16th. So I'm at a 64th right there. I'm gonna slide this out. I'm gonna go to a 32nd, maybe a touch under, okay? Then I'm gonna come up to the 10 inch point and we're going to set this at the, the larger dimension at the other end, which is 0.3 inches they had listed. So that comes out to seven, wait, let me get this correct, 930 seconds. So let me set that. That's just a 30 second over a quarter. So I'm gonna just bump that out. And there it is, close enough, right? So there, I've got the spacing correct. So I've got, what I've established here is the angle of the chopstick from one end to the other. Now, once we've got this set here like this, this piece is parallel on both sides. So I'm going to, let's see here. Let me show you, this is the front. I'm gonna just outline this, okay? And then this line, I would carry all the way, okay? So now, this is just like we've done before where I've shown you the very crude or the most primitive way to make a tapered leg. Same technique. We're gonna cut this away on the bandsaw. So rather than spending this time doing that, I just bandsaw to that line and then I could skim plane it a little if I make a little bumpiness, but you're just gonna end up with a tapering jig like this, okay? So now the piece will fit into that. And all I have to do is set my table saw blade to line up with this edge. Because that was the edge, if you remember what we referenced off. So when we 
rip that. This piece is hanging out enough that it's going to leave us the wedge of wood we're after. It's going to be larger here and taper down because we left overhanging the exact amount we wanted. Okay, so there we go. And then we can trim this after to where we want it. So let's go over and just rip this and then I'll show you the jig. So there the table saw is set to just barely touch here and we're going to turn on the dust collector and make a rip. Here we go. All right, that's all you do. You just make these tapers. So at this end, I'm just a touch about, I'm that little bit over. Uh, it turns out I'm right there. I wanted to set it so that wherever you're the right thickness for the end of your chopstick, you're just looking, this should be the profile that I just described. So up here, what is it? You're 930 seconds and then it comes down to basically 5 fourths, so thin at, and you want that actual 5 fourths to land on the end. So if it's up here for you, you're gonna cut it shorter. But you wanna make sure that it's uh, thinner than the 5 fourths or the same at the end when you make this wedge. So you're gonna do that with two pieces. So I had a second piece already parallel that was exactly, because, and I ran them both through with my tapering jig and I've got my wedges, okay? So I attach those. Now I'm gonna show you my finished jig, okay? Here it is. Super fancy, <laughs> right? I mean, this is it. So here is the ramp in there, okay? Now, I took a spacer stick that was a little thicker than the 930 seconds because I know I'm gonna be I'm going to trim these down and I use that spacer stick to uh, apply these wedges to this MDF. This is just a little piece of MDF. I put a cleat right here to hold it in my vise. So it's a custom chopstick jig now. And so I get that piece in there and then I put my wedges on the side. Now I trim the sides of the wedges so that the overall width of that space plus the two wedges was a little wider than my block plane. So that creates a perfect little channel for my block plane to do its thing, okay? And then I just put these side rails up here. That's just some white pine. And I put a stop at the end that I planed lower. Now, when you initially set this up, I set my blade nice and even and I tested it on some stock, like by, I don't know if I can do it with this, by seeing how thick the shaving is on one side versus the other. So I did that until I felt that shaving was perfectly, or felt perfectly the same. So I knew my blade was parallel. That's what you want. Then you're gonna come in and break in your jig. So you'll start planing and you'll be planing some of this off actually. I just got a little off that. So you're gonna feel you'll be skimming and planing some of your runners because your blade is extended out be beyond the sole here. So it's gonna cut for whatever distance your blade is into your runners. But then it won't be able to cut anymore because if you notice that blade does not go all the way to the edge. If it did, you'd keep planing away your ramps. But this edge of steel and this edge of steel become the guides. Those are what are actually running on the wood, much like a shooting board is. When you're using a shooting board, that little piece of metal down there is prevents your, your low angle plane from cutting into the stop any further than your blade is beyond the sole, okay? So now, I didn't want to set that up too much, but 
I took some shavings off initially, and then it just started to run smooth. You could put a little wax on there, jazz it up, and you will have your own custom planing uh, chopstick maker, okay? <laughs> now, we just need a couple other little things to add. So to prep our material, look, I got some coca bolo, and I've got some purple heart. You're gonna be amazed how fast this goes. So this is the pre-sawing tapering jig that I made. So this is just one of those tapered cuts. So after we, after we made our cut to get our little ramp, I just had this piece, which had the exact same angle, had the exact same long taper, but it was on basically the unusable part. So I put a stop at one end and now this parallel side is gonna ride on my bandsaw fence and I can set my stock that I wanna make my chopsticks out of against that. And I'm gonna set my bandsaw blade so it's a little stronger than our 964 down here. And we'll make our tapering cut and it's gonna get larger. And we just wanna make sure we make it larger than the finished dimension so we have something to plane. Now, all I did was square these up and I cut them to 10 inches in length. So these are already our chopstick length. Same with this Coca Bolo. Look at that check there. So I'm going to try to get some out of this. This isn't much good for a lot of things, but you can get some chopsticks out of this. If I come down this side right here, I should be able to avoid that check if I taper to the small end. So I'll flip it this way and we'll come off of this. So let's go to the bandsaw. We'll knock these out and I'll show you how fast we can get some chopsticks. Turn on the dust collector. All right, so you can see how with just a small chunk, if this would had the full integrity of it, you could get a lot of these blanks out just like that. So as you saw, I made the first cut and got the long higher taper. And then I laid it flat and used the same jig again to give us our close to our final taper. But they're actually a little, little thick still, 
I hope. <laughs> Gotta check it in here. Yeah, they are. All right, I can't even fit it in there, so <laughs> I made it a little too narrow. All right, I'm gonna just take a couple swipes off of this. I made that one a little too heavy. So, so if you do that, you'll just take a couple swipes. Tom, are you gonna talk about the toxicity of some of these woods? Oh yeah, um, that is can be a problem. <laughs> 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 As we prepare to put them in our mouths. The understatement. No, I mean, I, usually when we talk about the toxicity, we're talking about the um, the dust. Okay, so I used my, you definitely want to use a dust collector for this. I didn't go under there. Um, and now I, see, I've got this one where I can fit it in there fine. Now you could wedge this in with a, piece coming the other way but I found that it stays pretty nice and I've got my little stop at the end there so now I'm going to set my shooting plane right in here and then little setup we're just gonna go right on down and now I'll go almost all the way but look at we're getting full length shavings I'm gonna flip this over around there's my band saw inside. There it is. Again. Oops, make sure there's no dust in there. But yeah, the dust on some of these woods can be really an irritating experience. The first time I read about that was a book James Krenoff was talking about Coca Bolo project he had, and it was really nasty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's some conversation here about um, Pat, Pad, Paduk. Paduk. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, various different woods. The tough one. Yeah, this is a planed edge, so I left a little before I cleaned up that first bandsaw edge. Now I'm going to just go all the way with this. So what's cool is you can feel. I could have set that a little closer, but but now I'm getting pretty much nothing okay so it's time to rotate and get the last side so this is a custom shooting board to make <laughs> perfection with chopsticks and this has nice weight to it it's got rigidity and it's crisp it's beautifully hand planed all four sides and it comes down to the perfect dimension you know you've got the perfect dimensions because your ramp is set that way, okay? Then let's try one of these purple hearts. I'm gonna take a little off up here. Lupe's curious about green direction. Is there any concern there? Oh yeah, um, yes, Lupe. I was looking at that when I was um, at the bandsaw. So you're trying to have straight stock, obviously, as straight as you can. Um, but I noticed that it was running out a little on the bubinga, so I positioned it to run favorably with the taper. You'd want to pick as straight a stock as you could, but let's see how this plans. Not bad. I hadn't done one of these yet. That's pretty nice. Man, it's nice to have a little setup like that. Then we'll take it out. There's our bandsaw inside. to get some sushi now <laughs> I think you use that with your fingers don't you don't you pick it well, up when I was in Nashville a couple weeks ago kids took me to a sushi place for my birthday and they didn't have any other kind of utensil but chopsticks really so, so you didn't but you use that for your I did oh. it was it was pretty sloppy but I did <laughs> <laughs> So this could be a problem where you would, like I got a little tear out there and that's where I would wanna wedge it in, but I don't have my wedge, just a tiny bit right at the top. Then it was smooth. Um, let's do one more at the end. 
Such a pretty color, gosh. Yeah, it's pretty nice and it has a good texture. Okay, that's it. We're, we're smoothed down. So this one is identical here. So very quickly you have beautiful, identical, classic Japanese pieces. Now to finish them, we're going to want to sand them. But before we sand, we want to facet or usually they have like a little pyramid roof on the ends of them. You can't leave it just like that. So this is a little addition to my jig, just a little stop that I can put it up against and overhang the end of my bench. I'm just going to take the other little plane and hold it at about a 29 degree angle. Well, actually, I don't know what it is. I'm just going to go. You're just taking a nice little chamfer. Now, what is that angle? Can you guys tell from home? <laughs> just feel it. This is where you want to just be in the moment. Then I'm going to roll it. Let's go to the other side. It's pretty quick if you... I put a nice strong chamfer on this one. So I got them about equal. Now I'll go to the opposite sides. <laughs> and we Getting make a, a yeah. little jewel here. Look at that. <laughs> Boy, it's, it's shiny too. It's pretty. Yeah. So really I'd spend cool. a little more time, but there you go. You've got that sparkling little faceted end. And I would do that to both and to the purple heart as well. And then lastly, you're going to sand. So that's what this other stop is for. And I've got some pretty fine, I think 320 or 420, but I don't have any of that right now. I've got some 600 paper. I'll just give you, before we do that though, we probably want to skim these corners. So, you know what, I, this is the one thing my jig doesn't have. I need like a little V channel or something to knock the corners off this easily. <laughs> I guess I can just hold it up like this. I'll just take a few quick swipes. Look at how those shavings are. They're so wispy and small, but they're softening the corners. You could sand this, but it's pretty hard wood, but it's taking to planing quite nicely, but that gives it a nice feel. Now the Japanese are also, they're closer to round at the bottom. So you can be a little more generous taking the corner off at the bottom. Just a little, a couple more strokes on all four sides. I wouldn't fuss with it though and try to get it round. Um, if it has a little edginess to it, it's easy to pick up the fish. Right? <laughs> the sashimi. Yeah. All right, so there, that feels nice. It has a little bit of a shape. And then lastly, we're just gonna polish it up with a little sanding. Again, I've got a little stop block there, same as the other. But I could see these would make wonderful gifts. I almost wanted to make them out of a gaboon. When gaboon ebony wasn't so expensive, um, like one block like that is about $75, 75 to $100. Um, like this, like a full block like that. And, uh, I remember getting those for like 20, 15, 20. Anyway, I made my son, he was into drumming. Remember that Christmas? Uh, yeah. I made him a pair of solid Gaboon Ebony drumsticks, <laughs> which he, I didn't realize how much he liked those, but he never used them on the drums. He just keeps them as he moves around, so that's nice. That's really sweet. He's got that out in uh, Pasadena now. Michael says that if you put the purple heart, the purple heart into the oven at 350 degrees for an hour, it'll keep its color and the oil will lock in. Did you know that? I did not know that. Hmm. That's a quite the tip. So food safety, what are, what are your, Willie's curious and I've heard, seen that question before. What? Um, I don't think it's like, it's not like it's a poison dart. It's, uh, it's wood. It's the, it's when you eat it and get the dust in your, you know, I would finish these 
you could finish it as simply with an oil. Um, some of the articles I read, they actually said they were like lacquered. I don't think I'd want to put lacquer on there. Um, but there, you could put a um, tongue oil. Like I was just reading the other night about genuine tongue oil that they have some at um, the milk paint company. You can get a little four ounce bottle and it will cure and it's totally food safe. It's from the, a nut. Um, anyway, that you could put on a couple of three coats yeah, and you get a nice walnut, soft sheen to it. Oil. So yeah, so here's a couple that I made a little earlier. You can see that both ends are faceted, but this is a pair of Cocobolo. Look how straight they are and they're true. Nice. And I would clean them up. I'd sand them a little more, but there you have. Oh, I see some sushi in our future. Look at, I, I'm that not very good so at this. Good. But Beautiful. I read articles. You're supposed to rest that first one right in there <laughs> on the ring finger. We'll leave that instruction other to others. <laughs> it's like I am not, I don't, you don't take lessons from me. I no, always give not, up on it. Not on that one. Yeah. So, that's cool. There you have it, a nice little project that's outside of the bounds of our typical <laughs> Shop Night Live, but it is woodworking and it is a way to make an exceptional gift. Now you could go a little further and make a little stand like these little wooden stands that they rest on. So when you put them down, the points are like up off the table, but I'll leave that to you to research and really get into it, how to embellish and enhance your chopstick pleasure. So that, that's something that could be even sold for gifts if you were into it, but it's tough competition because there are, there are a lot out there <laughs> and they're mass produced, I'm sure. Have but, you, um, Margaret's asking if you've ever, you had exotic wood color bleed into a contrasting white wood with finishing. That can happen. In fact, that was one of the warnings, I believe it was the Cocobolo that can happen, but I have not um, actually messed around with that. But yes, that's, that's a concern. And there are ways to try to prevent it. I know some people mask off and even pre-shellac the uh, exotic wood that tends to bleed. Uh, it's only with certain woods. I would do, always do a test. Obviously, this would be a more elaborate project that you're invested in. Um, so you would be testing that up. The, primarily what I'm using for accent woods is like wenge, uh, ebony, and I'm trying to think of any others. Some rosewood I've used and I've never had any kind of bleeding problems, but I'm usually with a little darker woods like mahogany as well. So that's something I'm afraid you'd have to trial and error it, but I did just read that. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for hanging out. You want to be on our mailing list mm -hmm. and get on there at epicwoodworking.com. And we do not send junk. We only tell no, you about, <laughs> <laughs> unless you consider what we're doing junk. We <laughs> do just keep you informed of the new happenings that we got going on here. Yeah. And also, if you like this content, please consider subscribing and sharing it and also making a comment and a like or two. On behalf of the Camerly and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time.